Welcome to The Jockey Club, a podcast looking at the movie Let It Ride, one scene at a time. My name is Dan Delgado, and we're at historic Hialeah Park where one man is having the best day of his life. I'm having a good day. So come on in and hang out while we talk about this day and the greatest movie of all time, Let It Ride. Don't worry about that guy at the door. I've got you covered. You can even take my seat to the jockey club. Welcome back to the Jockey Club. My name is Dan Delgado, and we are up to episode 28, which means that we are doing the 28th scene of Let It Ride. And really, it is the 28th scene according to me. This is the scene where Vicky finds Trotter out by the stables. And since we're doing a big Jennifer Tilly scene, I thought there'd be nobody better to discuss it with than Cassidy Watson Perry. Cassidy is not just a Jennifer Tilly fan, She's more like a Jennifer Tilly historian. She runs the social media accounts Fantastic Tilly on Instagram and Twitter, which are both dedicated to our Vicky, Jennifer Tilly, and her sister Meg. And since we're coming into the final stretch here on the podcast, I just want to remind you that leaving a rating and review is always appreciated. You can do so on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you may be listening to this. And if you're playing along at home, this is going to be from minute 11345 to 11736. All right, now let's head on up to my usual table at the Jockey Club to discuss test screenings, Jennifer Tilly, and the 28th scene of Let It Ride. All right, so first question I tend to ask people if they haven't done this before is if they can remember the first time that they saw Let It Ride and what their initial reaction to it was. And has that changed over time? I know this question very well from the homework that I've done. So the first time that I watched Let It Ride was five years ago. It was 2017. So I was really, I had just started my fantastic Tilly little media outlet. So I was kind of, you know, I wanted to get as much information on Jennifer's filmography as I could. So I essentially stumbled across this film through IMDb. So I watched it and, you know, you go into it as like solely a fan of one person. And I just really, really thought it was one of those very tropey, like late 80s comedies. But there was something about it that was very, very neat. And like, it was just very unique. I don't know how to explain it. Like, I loved all of the cast members. So you had, you know, you had Terry Gar, who's very, very funny. You had Jennifer, who is very funny, as we all know. And then we had Richard Dreyfuss and David Johansson. So you have all of these heavy hitter comedy people that were in one specific medium. And it was just so awesome. So when I watched this movie, my very first time going through it, I was paying attention to Jennifer. But I've watched it maybe two or three times all the way through since then. So I am able to say that, you know, I just wholeheartedly love everybody's performance in it. So it was neat, too, because... I feel like I'm going to go off on like Jennifer tangents, but it was neat because Jennifer actually was on Broadway in 2001 for a revival of The Women. So Cynthia Nixon actually was in Let It Ride, very, very small part. You know, she was in the scene at the club, you know, where they're all hanging out. So I was like, oh my gosh, you know, because it was kind of weird how like later on it would come to fruition that they would work together again. So it was like all these little parallels and all these like stars that you really didn't think were going to make it as big as they did. Because like once she did Sex in the City, that was it. So, yeah, I just I thought it was a really, really great 80s comedy. And it's also cool, too, because Jennifer now has like established herself as this mainstream gambler. Like she is a oh, professional yeah. poker player. Mm-hmm. So it was neat in hindsight to like look back and be like she literally did a movie that like prophesized her being in the gambling world, even though she was playing at the time, you know, she was teaching people on the set how to play. And it's just one of those really, really weird coincidences that it's, it's neat to see how it came to fruition. Oh, wow. So you're, you're telling me she was already 
a heavy poker player at the time that she was making Let It Ride? No, she not at the time, but she was teaching people on the set how to play. And she would they had little games where they would put in like 50 cents, you know, like really, really small bets. But it was just that was one of her hobbies, you know, during that time on film sets was to literally just teach her co-stars how to play poker and just to, you know, gamble with them. Like, like I said, really small amounts of money. So... That was very, very neat to to see how she could, you know, do a gambling film, but she was also gambling behind the scenes. Wow, that is a really great little tidbit. I had not heard this about uh, about this with the Let It Ride production. I love that. Jennifer Tilly teaching people how to play poker in the downtime. That's great. That's very cool. Okay, so if I were to ask you how this would rank, because I want this to be a, a very Jennifer Tilly kind of focused episode, because I... I've kind of focused in on, on certain people throughout certain episodes, and I haven't done one about Jennifer yet, and she absolutely needs to have a spotlight. She's got a lot of time in this scene that we're going to talk about here. So I'm just curious, as, as the Jennifer Tilly expert, how are we going to rank this in the Jennifer Tilly lexicon of, of movies? Is it lower third, middle third, upper third? Uh, Okay, so this is a very, very top tier Jennifer fan, like, or Jennifer film, excuse me. So we're talking, Jennifer literally, she loves this film so much. She loved her time working on it. She loved everybody that was involved with it. She literally has nothing bad to say about any of the cast members. She, She had the best time. And Joe Pitka, when he was directing her, I recently read a little blurb when I was like doing my outside research that she actually, Jennifer is like notorious for having like, She likes to reshoot scenes because as any girl, you know, if you see an angle that doesn't look up to par, you want to reshoot it. So I recently saw something, it was from Joe Pitka's website, actually, where he gave kind of like a documented story of how Jennifer, there was one particular scene, and I don't think it's the one that we're going to review today, but there was one particular scene where she kind of wanted to redo it. And Pitka had to talk her into, you know, Jennifer, you look fine. You look, you look great. But yeah, Jennifer, she loves this film to this day. She talks about it a lot whenever she does like recaps of her career. This is definitely, if you're, if you want to consider yourself like a hardcore Jennifer Tilly fan, this is definitely one of those films where it's in the top five. So this is a must see for any Jennifer Tilly fan. Wow. See that? I would not have guessed that it would have ranked that high, but I'm very happy that, that you said that though. It doesn't go above the ranks of, you know, Bound or Bullets Over Broadway, of course, or of course. which I would consider like most people know her from that. But this is one of those films like in her mind, you know, and if you're a true fan, you know, you want to kind of see what she sees. So she she loves this film so much. And it, it really does. It does show when she talks about it. All right. Thank you. That's perfect. All right, so let's talk about this scene a little bit. This starts out with Trotter is kind of wandering around the, the, the stables when Vicky approaches him. And so one thing that I was going to ask you, but then I sort of found an answer to it, is what do you think Vicky has been doing this time? Because we haven't seen her in a little bit. Trotter went home, tried to show his wife the money, ends up going back to the track. But Vicky's been at the jockey club this entire time. And so I was going to ask you, what, what do you suppose has been going on for her? But, and, and you can still answer that, by the way, if you have an idea. But looking at the script, and there is actually a scene that's not in the movie where it's just her and, and Bernie at, at the jockey club for like 30 seconds. But you have an idea. I'd love to hear it. So in my opinion, I really, I haven't seen the script and I would love if you would like forward me a link to that. But yeah, I really think that she was just in my mind, like, you know, as just a viewer. So I think that she was just at the, she was with Bernie, of course, money mooching off of Bernie. But she was just enjoying her time as like a socialite because like I just love how in this movie she's a small character. So you really don't see her until like an hour through the movie. Mm-hmm. But like whenever you see her, she steals the scene. So she's kind of like comedic relief. But it's also you think about it, too. I really think that she was pining over Trotter. So I like to think of that, you know, because I'm like a hopeless romantic. So I'm like, you know, I thought it was really <laughs> sweet. But yeah, I was going to give another answer, but I feel like that's going to come up in the next next few seconds or so. So I got a story to tell you about the the scene where she puts her hands over his eyes. So. Oh, OK. I'm all right. All right. All right. So the scene goes like this. 
Bernie is looking at the racing form, and Vicky says, can I have a dollar? And Bernie says, no. And Vicky says, you're mean when you lose, Bernie. And so he's been looking through his glasses out at the track, and he puts them down, and he looks at her, and he says, you look like a real tramp. Well, he probably doesn't say it like that. And then she picks up the glasses he was using and starts looking down the rail and then says, I'm going to the ladies' room. And then she leaves. And that's it. Although I should say it is written in here that when she gets up to leave, all the waiters stare. I'm going to read it exactly. All the waiters stare very hard as Vicky minces her way out of the jockey club. So there you go. A little maybe 30-second bit that was taken out of the um, that was maybe never filmed. So I'm assuming that you might know this, but this was actually one of those scenes where they played this for test audiences, and the, the test audiences really did not like the fact that it was implied, or originally implied, should I say, that Vicky was going to sleep with Trotter. So, you know, she makes that comment, you know, I figured that, you know, I'd you know, come down here, you know. So that <laughs> quote, yeah, yes, but yes. that quote, that was originally in the original, you know, fit or how test audiences received it. They wanted to leave it in that Vicky and Trotter slept together, but the test audiences did not react well to that. So they actually ended up taking it out subsequently and having Trotter say, I'm in love with my wife. So it makes everything seem very holistic which I find funny because I feel like now, you know, in 2022, I don't think that people would be, you know, so prudish about that. I think they'd be like, yeah, let's get all the sex we can get, you know, because like the sex sells and stuff. But yeah, back in 89, I test audiences apparently did not like the fact that Jennifer Tilly was going to sleep with Richard Dreyfuss's character. So they made him, they wanted to like, you know, give him, because he was already kind of, he had an element in this movie where he was kind of, unlikable to an extent oh yeah like you know mm-hmm. but and i think that that's originally what made audiences react that way but it w- it would have been very interesting to see how they had you know if they were able to get away with that but i guess that line made him seem somewhat holistic mm. but well in in the script that i have it, it does mention that he he grabs her breasts in yeah <laughs> in the crowd so so what would you have preferred since we're having this conversation. I honestly, okay, so Jennifer is like a notorious flirt. I, I feel like I keep mentioning her over and over again, but that's that's me. That's the goal. That's the goal. That's okay. That's the point. Mention her. Jennifer loves to like flirt with her co-stars. And I say that in the most utmost respect because I love her so much, but she is just, she's a natural flirt. And she's worked with Drive, but she worked with him again in 2000 in this little small independent movie called The Crew, where she played literally a stripper. So they kind of had like scenes together. They didn't actually do anything, but you know, they were, she was in like very risque clothing, more risque than in this movie. You know, they had that little, you know, there was a little bit of sexual banter there and undertones. But just for the sake of that, I would have liked to have seen or, you know, have it implied that Vicky and Trotter do have some sort of fling. Because I just, that's just me. I just think that for her, she would have, she would have loved that. And I think that audiences would have loved it. So if she could go on and tell the story like she does now, you know, that, yeah, I slept with Richard Dreyfuss in a movie. That's totally her sense of humor. So in this scene, the, the next thing that happens is she ends up asking him, what are you going to do? And he doesn't know. He's just sort of been wandering around. He's been kind of contemplating what he's going to do, what's his next bet going to be. And then he, they have this little exchange where he tells her that she can do better than Bernie. And I love this line from her because one thing I think about Vicky is that, as Terry Garr calls her earlier, she's sort of presented as an airhead, but yet at the same time, she says things that are fairly wise in a way, right? So she when she says, like, a girl has to decide what's more important, money or love, no one's giving anything away. You know, if, if you say that in a certain way, like when she says it, it's kind of funny and, and sweet. But if you think about what she's saying, it, there's a certain point that she's making there, right? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's kind of philosophical too. And it kind of goes back to the plot of the movie where it kind of ties in with everything. So little lines like that really do add flavor to the overall out, you know, the outcome of the film. So she then says, I just want to, as you pointed out earlier, I, and I love how she says it. She says this, this is the, the sweetest propositioning anyone has done. I just wanted to ask you if you wanted to go to bed with me because I think you're kind of funny. And I love, I love this line too because also, and she said this in interviews, so I'm not, or I'm going to paraphrase essentially, but she really did have like a Marilyn Monroe persona in this film. I don't, it's very, very obvious to me. I don't know if it would be obvious to the outside viewer, but in early on in her career, we're talking like mid to late 80s. So right at the prime, you know, when this movie was coming out, she really based her career off of this Marilyn Monroe persona. So she would up her voice a little bit and she would do the little hand gestures and she still does that now, but she would really, really accentuate what she has going on. So in this movie, it was just like that perfect, you know, this was before, this was way before Bound or anything where she was like playing the gangster's mall. But this was essentially like the prerequisite to that where she really does have that, you know, that very sexy element where she's almost trying to entice him, but you know, it doesn't work out in the end. But I just, I love the way that she goes about that whole Marilyn Monroe, Betty Boop persona. And I really do see that so much in this role. And I love it to death because, you know, Marilyn Monroe fan here. Like, (laughs) All right. So now here we have Trotter breaking the fourth wall in the movie. He turns to us after being propositioned to let us know, am I having a good day or what? Breaking the fourth wall is always one of those tricky things because... Sometimes it really can work, and sometimes you're just like, what are you doing? Stop doing that. How does this work for you? What do you think? I love fourth wall breaks. I love them so much. Literally, especially anything Jennifer involved, too, because it just seems like it's very on brand for her and the people that she works with. So I think essentially in this kind of film where it was a comedy-based film, it worked so great. And Richard Dreyfuss, he's the greatest, so like he can get away with doing that. But I think if you had just put any other character in there, I think it wouldn't have worked out so well. But with Trifish, you know, and Trotter being the main character, it really does. It gives a personal factor to the audience. So that's always the, you know, that's my initial reaction to fourth wall breaks. And I think he he pulled it off very, very well. Yeah, it's one of those things where you kind of go, all right, this guy is clearly having the best day that he could possibly have. And now you're going to tell me this This incredible looking woman is just offering herself to him. It almost seems like, listen, the movie is saying, yes, we know this is all really crazy. We should acknowledge this for a moment that this incredible looking woman is just going to walk up to, you know, this five foot four middle aged guy and and offer herself to him. So, yeah, there is. And also, I think the way that the movie kind of moves and feels in sort of a frenetic odd way you know there's odd close-ups at times it does a lot of different things that it kind of just goes right in there because so many other things that are just odd in this film it almost seems normal you know absolutely you you worded that so well yeah it's very quirky that's that's the word that i would use to describe it but it's it's a good quirky it's not like the off the wall quirky it's very it's quintessentially quirky so trotter ends up turning her down and says that he's in love with his wife. Hmm. Now, I can honestly tell you that when I saw this movie, and I was not quite 15, I remember being really shocked at this development. That, wait a minute, you're going back? The, the, the wife who's been nagging you the whole time. And instead of this woman here? What is wrong with you, man? I remember thinking this. Yes. And... That was my initial reaction as a viewer. I was almost mad. I was like, why? Why didn't you? Like, she was right there in front of you. Like, it was like she was treating you good. All the other women at this track are treating you like shit. Like, like you have the perfect one right there. She's offering herself to you. She's good looking. But yeah, in the end, I really think that they did a good job with having Terry Gore kind of be like his his wing woman and the one that he's always going to go back to in the end because you could tell that even though they got on each other's nerves and were crabby with each other that they really did have a good relationship and it was just that's the way it was established in the film so i really think that they did a good job with executing that 
Yeah, I think so, too. And it's one of these things that as I've gotten older, I look at it and I go, oh, yeah, well, Terry Gar, first of all, she's right almost the entire movie. I'm so much more on her side as, as an adult than I was as a teenager. And if he goes ahead and has the fling with, with Vicky, it kind of pushes him into maybe a li- little too unlikable. You know, we, we, have, to, feel yes, we have to feel absolutely. for Trump. Yeah. Because as I mentioned before, he really did have this factor about him in this movie where it was kind of like, damn, why am I rooting for this guy? Like, he's kind of like really unlikable to it, really, you know, umpteenth degree. But I think, yeah, that really, that saved him in the end. So I think, again, I think that's why the test audiences really reacted negatively to the original, the way that it was, they wanted to execute it. But yeah. Yeah. So. Who knew that test audiences could could do something positive once in a while. I'm always against the test audience, that whole idea, that whole concept. But every so often I hear about something like this and I go, well, I guess that's why you do it. And that was a direct quote from Jennifer. So I learned that directly from her. And I would not have known that until about, you know, three years ago. She did a, a podcast interview with Ileana Douglas, the actress. Oh, yeah, sure. That's a good she, really, she went into thorough detail about this movie and she just gushed over Richard Dreyfus and Terry Gore and everybody. It was just it was amazing. And so we finish up this scene with her saying to him, well, I just thought that I'd ask, that's all. And then I think everyone loves this line where she just says, well, you know, it's what they say, nothing ventured, nothing ventured. And which is such like her. I I think what really makes that line great is her delivery on that line. Right. Yes, because she takes this little pause. It's like nothing ventured, nothing. And you could tell that like the gears and like her brain are turning and she's like ventured. So I just I, I, I love that delivery. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. And you know what, Cassie? We are actually at the end of the scene, if you can believe it already. Actually, I do have another question for you. I would love to know what was it that started you on your Jennifer Tilly obsession, if that's the right word to to describe it. So I, if you can believe it or not, I've been a fan of Jennifer's, well, I say fan, because back then I really didn't know exactly, you know, who she was in depth. But I really became a fan of hers back when I was probably about six years old. That was six or seven. But... I like, like most children, like most parents do, I watched Bride of Chucky because I had no filter. (laughs) I had no filter. Yeah, so I watched Bride of Chucky. I remember that was, I believe that was the first film that I saw with Jennifer in it because I had got Seed whenever that came out on DVD. I remember getting it. My parents bought it for me from Best Buy back in the day. But yeah, I remember seeing her in Bride of Chucky and there was something like, not just because of the content of the film, but there was something about her that was so unique and I was never able to like pinpoint it. And as I've gotten older, you know, I really, I went back, I saw Bride of Chucky as I got older, which was in 2017. So I was like, I really want to like delve more into her career. So... You know, I started watching literally everything. So I am, I'm an IMDb junkie. So I started from the very, very bottom and I scrolled and I made my way up and I have now seen, and I am so happy that I can announce it. I have seen everything on her IMDb, but yeah, I, I was really just drawn to how unique she was. And I ended up looking up a lot of facts about her and I found out that she was half Chinese, which that, you know, I always thought that she was so beautiful and I, I just was like, She's from another world. So I, I found that out and I just thought that was fantastic. And I ended up, like I said, going down her filmography, checked out everything. Had no idea that she was nominated for an Oscar until like I'd gotten older. Oh, but yeah, I remember. it was then I had also, without even realizing it, I had also discovered Meg Tilly because I'm also a big psycho fan. So I remember watching Psycho 2 in high school and I had seen, you know, her last name was Tilly, but I really, it didn't resonate that they were, you know, related at all. But um, yeah, I've, I'm same with Meg. I love them to death. I talk to them occasionally through social media. You know, I have their contact information. So they're very, very humble and they're so sweet. And I really think that that attributes to why I am such a huge fan of them both. 
because not only are they immensely talented and have this gift and, you know, are so, so unique and just have this this thing about them that just makes you want to keep watching them, but they are so, like I said, so genuinely humble. And I just love them to death. And I consider them like my West Coast aunties because like, you know, they're like they're all the way there, but they still, you know, they'll they'll reach out to me once every, you know, once every so often. And and they're just they're incredible. And I really do. I feel like they're honorary family. Oh, wow. Cassidy, (laughs) thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Jockey Club. This episode was hosted and produced by me, Dan Delgado. Thank you to my guest, Cassidy Watson Perry. You can find her on Instagram and Twitter, talking all things Jennifer and Meg Tilly under the name Fantastic Tilly. Or you can just check the show description for a link. Our theme music is from Epidemic Sound. Our cover art is by Sean Labrie. If you enjoyed this episode, and I really sincerely hope that you did, then you can help the show out by buying me a coffee. Yes, it's a real thing and not a hustle. There's a link in the show and description on how to do it. And there's also a link in there where you can get yourself or someone you love some Jockey Club merch as well. Now, if you're saving up all your pennies to bet on the four horse, well, hey, your pal Dan understands. You can still support the show by leaving a free five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you may be listening to this. You can contact me through email, dan at moviemaker.com. I love getting emails from you listeners. And I'm also on Twitter way too much at underscore Dan underscore Delgado. Or even better, I'm on the Repod app, which is a great way to not only listen to podcasts, but to interact with hosts as well. You can find them in your app store. Come on by and say hello. This has been Dan Delgado for The Jockey Club. And remember, sometimes you could be walking around lucky and not even know it.